Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the show, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, a former army captain, almost presidential candidate, best-selling author, and fellow fan of the West Wing, Jason Kander. Jason served as an intelligence officer in Afghanistan in 2006 and 7, and was elected to the Missouri State Legislature in 2008, and as Missouri Secretary of State in 2012. In 2016, he was the Democratic nominee for Senate in Missouri, and in President Barack Obama's final Oval Office interview, he was asked who gave him hope for the future of the country, and Jason was the first person he named. He began laying the groundwork for a presidential run in 2018, and then he pivoted to declaring his candidacy for the 2019 Kansas City mayoral election, which took a lot of people by surprise. Then three months into that campaign, and as the clear favorite in the race, he ended his candidacy and stepped back from public life after revealing that he had suffered from PTSD and depression since coming home from Afghanistan. Today, Jason's the president of National Expansion at Veterans Community Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to fighting veteran suicide and homelessness. He's also the host of Majority 54, a popular political podcast, and he's the author of Outside the Wire, 10 Lessons I've Learned in Everyday Courage, and his most recent book, Invisible Storm, A Soldier's Memoir of Politics and PTSD. So Jason, thanks for doing this. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Really glad to be doing this. Um, Personally enjoyed your book. You talk about this long period of time where you served as an intelligence officer in Afghanistan and then you come back. um, And around a year later, you got elected to the state legislature. And then it was 11 years until you came forward saying that you had PTSD and depression. And I'm just really interested for starters in what was going on inside of you during that period of time. Did you know that you had PTSD? Did you think you were going crazy? Uh, I didn't know that I had PTSD. In fact, I was actively convincing myself that I did not have PTSD for uh, for a few reasons. Um, one, probably for the same reason that a lot of people do that, which is, you know, our culture regards PTSD as a terminal uh, diagnosis. It's not, uh, and that's why I wrote the book is to make sure people understand that so they'll go get help. But the only portrayals of PTSD we ever see are what I refer to as PTSD porn, like you know, just voyeurism of people who are untreated and are, you know, in the throes of PTSD and the most extreme cases, like that's what we see, right? Uh, Like on film and that kind of thing. So that's like what I thought PTSD was. So I was like, well, I don't want to have that. So that was part of it. Also, because, uh, because I, uh, you know, I, I felt like saying I had PTSD was like stolen valor because I knew people who had been physically wounded or, you know, and it's so, and that that's what happens to a lot of soldiers as well. And so for all those reasons, I was really actively working to convince myself I didn't have PTSD. So to the second part of your question, after a while, yeah, I just thought there was just something wrong with me. I mean, when you've, when you've been experiencing uh, symptoms of PTSD and not know it's PTSD for as long as I did, I mean, like you said, almost 11 years by the time I got treatment, um, toward the end, I just thought, well, this is what I am now. This is how I am now because I didn't remember, it was like hard to remember not feeling that way. And it gets progressively worse over time. Um, So yeah, yeah, I just thought there was something really wrong with me. What were the, what were some of the symptoms that you were having in particular? Like what are some of the ones that stand out to you? When I first came home, uh, there were, it was kind of the beginning of what I now know to refer to as hypervigilance, which was to say, I felt like there was a lot of danger around me, right? So uh, it'd be things like, um, you know, not being very comfortable in crowds, uh, not, uh, not being at first, not being comfortable being on the road. Uh, I got over that because it turns out as I learned in therapy later, if you just go back and do something enough, you can, uh, you can kind of get to the point where it, it doesn't affect you in the same way. Um, but I didn't know I was doing that then I just had to drive places. Right. Um, and, uh, and then not long after I got home, uh, is when my nightmares started, um, night terrors, um, that, that symptom just got worse and worse over time. The hypervigilance got worse and worse over time. And then eventually those two things kind of gave way to not gave way. They continued, but they sort of, uh, evolved into incorporating these other symptoms like, um, depression, but the depression was more like a product of a a couple of things. One, like self-loathing from 
just the, the whole trauma feeling unworthy, but, uh, but also at the same time, like, I think I, I was looking for a sense of control by feeling like, well, if I feel shame, I'll feel something. I, I kind of learned that in therapy that that was part of what I was doing. But also I had these, uh, disturbing thoughts or disruptive thoughts and, and memories. And so I would try to numb those emotions. I didn't realize that's what I was mm -hmm. doing. I just thought, well, I feel better if I, you know, if I'm not alone thinking, and so I will stay really busy or I'll listen to music or I'll have a podcast on or I'll watch, you know, yeah, I'll watch news or something. Have just always have something on at all times. Yeah. But so then, you weren't with your experience. You were doing something else. Yeah. Right. And, and then, yeah. uh, that combined with terrors really contributed to depression. Um, and I, I ended up really emotionally numb because I was numbing out all these emotions, but you can't just numb the negative ones. And so I just kind of was not present at all. Uh, you know, that's some of the stuff, there's other stuff, but that's some of the stuff that really stands out, um, that just got worse and worse. And then eventually toward the end of that 11 year period, if you haven't been sleeping and if you've been depressed for long enough and you have all this other stuff going on, you know, you, you end up with suicidal thoughts and that's really what got my attention. Was this something that you got a lot of training around or was there any communication mm -hmm. around prior to going off to Afghanistan? Uh, none. Uh, the the yeah. only thing I remember once during intelligence school, they had a chaplain. They had like somebody from every specialty branch come in just to kind of tell us, hey, you're probably about to deploy soon. Here's how you should use your, you know, here's how you should use your unit doctor. Here's how you should use your unit okay, JAG, cool. which is the army lawyer. Yeah. Here's how to use yeah. for your troops. Here to, here's how to use the chaplain. And when the chaplain was coming in just to talk about, here's the best way to utilize your chaplain he happened to say in passing, uh, well, you know, PTSD is a, is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation, which is a great way to describe it, but it's literally, that is quite literally the sum total of the PTSD training or explanation that I got, uh, before wow. I deployed. And he, and it wasn't in the, he just said it like, yeah. Wow. Okay. So I mean, that's wild for starters. Yeah. Um, but when you were coming back, did you receive, was there anything that the army gave you in terms of um, additional support or resources, people to talk to you, just like when you when you ended up leaving? Because uh, you tell a great story in the book about when you walked in and kind of handed it in your papers. Yeah, so also no. Um, but okay. uh, I yeah. do think that that has gotten a little bit better. Um, okay. I, I don't think it's anywhere near where it should be, but there is you know, they, they, they do actually have sort of more of an out processing period. Now my coming home from the deployment was a little unique because I had, I had volunteered to deploy to Afghanistan. And so I, I had gone over as what's called an individual augmentee, which is just to say that I didn't go over like with a unit and come back with a unit. So even if at that time there were sort of out processing and screenings for units, I was, that was not available to me because I, I went over to fill a spot and I came home uh, you know, not with a large group. And so when I came home, it was like, okay. And I was a reservist. So my active duty orders ended and, uh, I went back to being a drill and reservist. So like I came home from Afghanistan and two weeks later, I was back at my job and my civilian job. And one of the things that's really interesting that they talk about a lot with PTSD is that what tends to support people afterwards or, or increase either increase the chance that somebody contracts PTSD after they go through a stressful situation or lower the chance is just the presence of a lot of support of different kinds, structural support, individual support, like social support. But another big thing that people talk about is not immediately having a lot of stress right after going through a really stressful experience and you're, you're leaping from being in duty to coming back and having this incredibly promising political career that was also, I'm sure, incredibly stressful. Yeah, I. it's pretty hard for me to point to a period between returning home in early 2007 and yeah. dropping out of public life in October of 2018 and say, that was a really stress-free, like... <laughs> I like weak. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, uh, I, I really can't think of anything. Um, you know, I think we went on a vacation or two, but I think even that, uh, you know, for me, lots of things were stressful that might not have been for other people because I had PTSD and didn't know it. So you're, there you are, you're contemplating a bid for president. You pivot to running for mayor. It's 
three days before you actually decide to walk in and say, hey, I need some help, you're probably thinking that like this is going to torpedo your political career on one level or another. What was that like for you? Like, What was, what was going on inside of you? It was a combination of two things. One, yeah, I was pretty down and felt like a failure because I had worked really hard and been uh, professionally very successful in a short period of time. I mean, that's the thing also is that to other people, it, you know, people, it's very, it's nice. It's complimentary that people re refer to it as this rapid rise or this meteoric rise, et cetera. And that's nice. And I guess objectively, you know, if you go from running for the state house to running for president, basically in, uh, inside of 10 years that I, that is fast but when you do it it doesn't feel fast um when you and especially you know when i dropped out of everything i was 37 years old um you know i'm 41 now so and then i had just spent 11 years in electoral politics which means like almost a third of my life <laughs> that's what i'd been doing so it didn't feel like oh it's been a really short time to me it just felt like i you know, I'd spent m pretty much my adult life uh, doing that. And so I, I spent it building something. And so that period uh, where before I started therapy, but after I decided to drop out and after I dropped out of everything was on the one hand, very depressing because it was just like, I just felt like a huge failure. And also there's something about knowing that like the whole world is projecting a lot of sympathy toward you that is you know on the one hand you you appreciate it um, but on the other hand it really makes you feel rather pathetic right so so when there's like when the number one story in the country is that you have PTSD and you know that even though you have made a what you think is a decision for yourself like to help yourself you don't have any idea if it's going to go well but like it's like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to make the right decision here. And at that point, like I wasn't like huddled in a corner. I wasn't in the worst spot. I'd been there and that's how I had made the decision. But I was like, you know, standing on my own two feet and trying to move forward and feeling like the whole world, like, you know. Yeah. From, no, you're about to become the poster child for a stigmatized condition. Right. Like and, that's no joke. Yeah. And so there's definitely an element of like, okay, I've just, I've just, hit the self-destruct button on everything that I've built. Sure. Yeah. And everybody, uh, thinks that I am in a really bad way because I wasn't giving sure. any interviews and I had always been the guy who was everywhere mm -hmm. and I wasn't yeah. giving interviews because I just was like, I need to focus on getting better. I don't need to focus on like portraying myself as better. Cause that's what I had done for so long. So I'm like not answering calls from Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton and you know, all these people which wild people, people to not pick up the phone on yeah but yeah and, but it was like i was trying to make a, a good choice but i knew it also made everybody think like i was in a bad spot when really i just was like i i'm not going to go on good morning america and talk about ptsd i don't know anything about it like i just i was wrong for 11 years like i'm not the guy who should go talk about it so there was that and then on the other hand there was sort of this little seedling of hope like like i can remember um a few days after I dropped out and even before I started therapy, I just remember I was, I was trying to fill my time. So I was running errands. I think I was like driving to the grocery store or something. And, um, it was October, but it was like a pretty nice day. So like I had the windows down and I remember thinking like still being like wrecked by depression, but I remember thinking maybe this could be okay. Like maybe not doing something all the time. But then of course, then stuff like starts rushing back in and you're like, oh, okay, well I should put on, I should listen to some music or something. But I, I can remember having moments of being like, okay, maybe this can be all right. But then the other problem was, um, I had no idea whether I could get better. Like I, I now know that the vast majority of people who commit to treatment get better and they get to a point where PTSD is not disruptive to their life. I didn't know that then. So I had just cashed in everything I'd ever built for the possibility of getting better. And I was like, maybe I'm too far gone. Like maybe I just cashed all this in the one thing that was going well. And I'm just, this is how I am forever. So it was just yeah, a really yeah. uncertain period.
Yeah. And what was it like for you just actually going into, I think it was the VA that you went into um, the first time, like both in terms of what how you were actually processed, got some curiosity around that, but mostly more, how did it feel to do that? So the first time I did it was before I made my announcement. So it was, I think the day before hmm. I made my announcement. Yeah. And, um, and so that was just the big, and I knew that I was going to drop out the next day. So that just felt rotten because that was just like, yeah. I just knew I was at the beginning of this baton death march that I didn't know where it was going to lead. So I was pretty down. And also, um, you know, uh, everybody in town knew my face. So, which was a great thing when running for mayor and made, made me the guy who like was going to be the mayor. Um, but it was not, <laughs> it was not the best thing when you're checking in to the VA and you look like hell. Um, and, uh, and then, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, that's how I ended up in the suicide hold room at the, at the ER at the VA with the guy asking me, uh, you know, he was like the one guy there who didn't recognize me was the psych resident on duty who then when I was explaining, yeah, I was going to run for president, decided to run for mayor, but I'm going to call that off, you know, and it ends with him asking me like, what does that mean? And me being like, well, I, you know, I <laughs> spent about an hour and a half just me and President Obama, he seemed to think it was a pretty good idea. And the, by the end of it, he's like, how often do you hear voices? Cause like he, you know, so he just thinks I'm, yeah. you know, just imagine the whole thing. So that was an interesting uh, first day, but, but yeah, that's what it was like for me was just, you know, I mean, anybody who's ever gone and checked into something and started a process that can be a long process, like it's, it's not fun to begin with. Like if you've ever waited at the DMV, uh, but it, if you add to that, like, you're checking in because you're <laughs> you're kind of at rock bottom personally like it's not the best the va did a great job uh for me w once i got in the the system was difficult to navigate and i got help with that from veterans community project where i now am president of national expansion but uh once in the va fantastic experience so you mentioned working with vcp in order to navigate the VA a little bit better. Do you think that there are, like, what are some of the resources that you think would be particularly helpful for veterans trying to navigate these kinds of systems? Like, is it generally pretty approachable or is it pretty tough? It's always a hard question to answer because I don't want to discourage any veteran listening from, you know, embarking on navigating the system. Uh, they have made improvements, um, but, you know, ultimately there are ways in which it can be difficult. Uh, I ran into a situation where they were like, hey, you're not enrolled in the system yet. So you, for you to start getting help here at the VA, it's going to be a few months to get enrolled in the system. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to wait a few months. Like I'm generally like once you're there for mental health treatment, you're like, it's now or maybe never. Um, and so Veterans Community Project just knew exactly what to do and which stuff to file and how to make that move quickly. And they did. And I, so I was fortunate that they were based in Kansas City, so I got that help. Um, now, because it's my role to have them based other places as well, that, that's that's what we're doing. But uh, there are some changes that could be made at the national level. Now that I've spent the last three years uh, in the veteran space, I've learned a lot about this. And there's a few things. Like when you're in the military and you uh, PCS, which is a permanent change of station, like basically when you transfer from one place to the next, like let's say you're you know stationed at Fort Leonard Wood here in Missouri and you get transferred to Fort Huachuca where I did Army Intelligence School in Arizona. Well, when you do that, there's a like a readiness personnel sergeant in uh, at Fort Leonard Wood at your unit who knows you're going and expects to hear from his counterpart at the unit that you're going to at Fort Huachuca. So when you get there and you get checked in and you report and they get you to your, to your, your housing and all that stuff, you know, he gets an email that's like, Hey, warm handoff, complete, got him. You know, you can check him off your, off your list. And it's like, okay, cool. When you, uh, ETS, which, you know, when you end your service, um, they don't do that. Like they know where you're going. They got your home and record. They know where you're headed to. Um, they don't, like do a warm handoff with the VA. There's no system where it's like, it should be like, Hey, your last order, your last, you know, uh, order you're given is you, you got to go check in with the local VA and get enrolled in the system. Um, and, and get your primary care person assigned to you and all that stuff. 
uh, but they don't do that. And if they did, because the problem is, you know, most, uh, I can just speak for the army, most soldiers, we, I don't know if I can speak for the whole army, but that's my experience. My, you know, <laughs> most soldiers don't see themselves as veterans for many years. Like I understand that I'm a veteran, but like my mm. memoir, the subtitle is a soldier's memoir of politics and PTSD. Like, yeah. So, you know, the idea of going to the VA, it's like, that's for old people is how you feel, right? It's for yeah. old guys, it's for guys gotcha. from Vietnam and, and stuff. You don't think of it that way. And so you just kind of go back to life, but you but you may not be in a position to navigate it. Um, and so there needs to be a warm handoff where it's just expected, hey, the last thing is you're going to make sure that person's enrolled at the VA. Maybe they don't need it, but make sure that they have it in case they do need it. Um, and then there's other stuff too, like how we started this conversation, which is there, they do a better job now of screening folks. Although you do have the problem of like on their way out the door. A lot of the times people are going to make, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm ready to go home. You know what I mean? But what we still don't do from what I can tell is educate people at all about PTSD on their way into the military. And so for instance, during my book tour, I remember I was checking into a hotel in, in DC and, uh, I got into a conversation with the clerk who was checking me in, uh, a young woman who was, uh, who had just completed basic training and she was an army reservist and she had just completed basic training. And, uh, I ended up giving her a copy of the book because she said to me, she was like, Oh yeah, I, I feel like I learned a lot about PTSD and basic training. And I was like, Oh, that's great. Like, are they, are they doing briefings on it now? And that kind of thing. And she goes, Oh no. She said, I just, you know, most of our drill instructors have been to Iraq or Afghanistan and I just kind of watched them and I can tell that they, they probably have PTSD. And, and so the problem, I mean, there are many problems with that, but the thing in my experience, like cognitive processing therapy, which is half of the therapy that I did at the VA to me was like graduate school about my brain. I mean, it was, yeah, we did, we did talk therapy and there was like some analytical stuff about how my symptoms match up to what PTSD presents as. But a lot of it was my therapist, Nick, standing at a whiteboard and teaching me how PTSD works and therefore teaching me how my brain works. And if all you did in basic training was spend one day, like one half day block of instruction, even just doing some of that you would save lives because you would have more soldiers who could recognize it in themselves, either when they left the army or before, or just be able to recognize it in their battle buddies. And, and we don't do mm. that. And, and I, I think that that is costing a lot of lives. Yeah. That psychoeducation aspect is super important. Um, just for like the awareness part of it. And then also I think like maybe a validation aspect attached to that, like yeah. you mentioned, feeling kind of like you hadn't earned PTSD um, and having maybe a broader understanding of what it is and what causes it and what the symptoms are might have gotten you in the I door mean, earlier. When you first go in, like they teach you how heat stroke presents, you know, they, they let you know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. they're like, this is what it looks like. Totally. You know, this is, this is how a person acts when they have heat stroke. This is how to prevent it. Yeah. Well, I mean, why would this be any different? Yeah, no, totally. And so you mentioned doing some cognitive reprocessing stuff, some psychoeducation attached to that with the whiteboard. Was there anything else that you did that you found particularly useful as a treatment? So I did the cognitive processing therapy and then I did uh, prolonged exposure, which was very difficult, but very useful. Um, and, and that was the stuff where I had to sit with my therapist and I would, uh, I would just tell stories from Afghanistan. I would, I would just kind of, I would recount memories and, and the idea was I had to do it in the greatest detail I could possibly do it. I had to close my eyes and recount some of the more, you know, frightening stuff and, uh, and just, uh, you know, and he would listen, even though we would sometimes do the same story in consecutive sessions, he would listen as if he'd never heard it before. And he would ask me questions as if he'd never heard it before. And then we, I would record it on my phone. And so all my sessions were weekly. So then I would go home and every day my homework was to listen to this 45 minutes of me telling the story and I wasn't allowed to multitask. I had to close my eyes. I had to put in headphones and listen. And that would unlock additional pieces of the memory. And then eventually uh, I would get bored with that memory. And then that was how Nick knew that it no longer had a grip on me. It wasn't causing me to have a physical reaction. Then we'd move on to the next one. So that was very difficult and unpleasant and extremely effective. Uh, so worth doing. And then the other stuff that was difficult, but really useful was, uh, 
I think a version of prolonged exposure therapy, which he referred to as just in vivo practice, meaning I think like in life, you know, um, and that was where I went out and did the things that I had been avoiding for a long time. So I would watch a war movie about kidnapping, uh, as an intelligence officer, that was, you know, my, a lot of my nightmares were about that because there was always the risk of being kidnapped because I was out just with a translator a lot. And, um, and so, uh, and like going into meetings with, that might be a trap. And so, um, so I, you know, I watched movies about that or just, you know, more movies and then I, stuff I, I hadn't been watching for years. And then I did things like I would go on a walk and the idea was to try to go like a block and a half without looking behind me, or I'd go sit yeah, in a restaurant with yeah. my back to the door. Uh, and yeah. you know, and, and the idea was everything was 45 minutes. So like I would talk about the memories for 45 minutes, but then I also, it was like, try to sit for 45 minutes with your back to the door and not, well, it wasn't even, I didn't have a hope of like not turning around, but it was like, just try and stay in the yeah. seat for 45 minutes. And eventually after doing that enough, like, um, I got better at it and I got more comfortable doing it. And, you know, now, uh, like if, you know, it used to be that if I went to lunch with like, when I was secretary of state in Missouri, like when I went to lunch with my staff, like everybody understood, they didn't know me before the deployment. So it was just like the boss doesn't like it when people sit behind him, you know, it wasn't like a PTSD thing necessarily. Um, so it was just, everybody knew like, well, he's going to want that seat. And, and, and so now like if I go to lunch with people, um, if I'm having like a pretty stressful day or whatever, I kind of give myself a break and I'm like, I'm just, I'm just going to sit facing the door. Um, but if I go to lunch with a group of people, it usually like I can have my back face the door. It's not my preference necessarily, but that's, that's to me a huge difference. Like I can do it. But like yesterday I was traveling for work and, um, I was tired and I went to, I was in Dallas and I was like, I'm going to get some Mexican food. And I went to this restaurant and you know the lady took me to my seat it was just me she took me to my seat and there it was a seat like right in the middle of everything and and I was like I and I remember thinking about it for a second and I was like nah, I'm gonna give myself a break today so I said hey can I have that one over there and I just went to the back corner where I could see the entire place and but the difference is I could have sat there where she where she had me you yeah, had a choice I, I could have sat yeah. there and I knew I would have been okay sitting there I wouldn't have been stressed it was more like for me, it was more like, hey, um, you know, I got two kids and it was like, hey, you've got this meal that you're going to enjoy by yourself. Your, your flight's yeah. not for a couple hours. You're just going to sit here. And I was going to, I pulled up a baseball game on my phone and I watched a baseball game live on my phone. I was like, I'm going to sit here and enjoy this dinner. And I was like, I'm not going to be worried about who's sitting behind me. I'm just going to, you know, so that's the difference now uh, that it did for me. Well, I think that's a huge difference. And one of the things that people sometimes talk about with like traumatic experiences in general is how they can lead to people getting really stuck, um, stuck in different kinds of patterns, feeling like they're not at choice in their lives in a bunch of different ways. And so just like being able to make an active choice about, okay, I know I can do this thing, but I've had a long day. It's my preference to give myself a break. Wow. All of a sudden there's like so much freedom. in that. Yeah. I mean, look, I was a guy who prior to getting treatment was like, I did not sit with my back to a door. <laughs> like, like it just, yeah, I just yeah, didn't do yeah. it. And, and when I did, it was like in donor meetings and I hated it. And it made me really anxious. Like as a yeah. politician, I'd go in, I'd go to somebody's law firm and I'd sit there and, you know, if they're behind their desk, mm -hmm. you're sitting there mm -hmm. and your back's mm -hmm. the door. And I'd be, I would be moving around every second. I'd have my, my chair turned awkwardly so that I could at least get peripheral vision of the door. Um, and now like, I can, in fact, um, at a book event in, uh, it was actually that same, like when I met the the clerk, it was a book event in DC and I went out with, uh, some friends who had come to the event afterwards. And this was like a big thing for me that I'm sitting there, we're, we're having pizza at this place. And, um, my cousin who was there, he was like, Hey, your back's to the door. And I was like, Oh yeah. Like I, we were 45 minutes in maybe an hour in and I hadn't even noticed that I had sat there. And so that's a big deal for me. Totally. Totally. And Ted, Ask you a question about it, just maybe for people listening who aren't sure about their own experiences. Was there like a physical sensation that tended to accompany these like PTSD moments for you? Like, how did your body feel? Uh, tense. Like, I mean, obviously, but like, like it tensed up. Like, um, yeah. It's sometimes it was like, like your shirt's too tight. 
or like like you just feel like you can't yeah get it's i wasn't i wouldn't i usually was not like it wasn't a panic attack so i wasn't like hyperventilating but it was just like i didn't feel like i could get a full breath and 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 the way i describe it i think in the book uh or at least i'll this is the way i describe it i think i described it this way in the book is that um it's like for instance the thing with the sitting with your back to the door uh it's like you know that thing where you you haven't written something like let's say you go to the grocery store and well no more than that let's say you're you're going about your day and you know that there are three people that you've got to call back but you haven't written it down and you're trying to remember who all three people are and it's like and there's this little thing like okay you know you can go think about something else but like you keep returning to this thought because you're like I can't forget to call these three people back, right? So it's that. However, imagine that you feel like if you forget any of those three people, someone will kill you. <laughs> um, that's yeah. that's yeah. The stakes are incredibly yeah. high, and and that's yeah. that's what hypervigilance felt like to me. Was like it was yeah. like there was always something right behind me, right behind my ear, right right where you in a blind spot where you can't see it. And you're always trying to thwart that that threat or manage that risk. But you don't usually talk about it out loud because people look at you funny, right? Um, so that's that's what that part felt like. And then the other thing was that every risk, every threat of every threat of any kind, figurative or literal, just jumped to the top of the threat meter for me. My my brain, I now know, had lost the ability mostly lost the ability to triage threats in degrees. So, you know, I, I, my brain, everything was plausibly yeah, terrifying because my brain had learned yeah. that you control the threat situation or you're going to die. Like going into meetings with people who were double dealing with the Taliban and us, you know, you're like, you control everything. If anything's out of place, if anybody is there, who's not supposed to be there. And by the way, like, it's just me and my translator, like, and nobody knew where we were. So like, if things go bad, like ain't nobody coming to save me. Right. So I'm going, okay. All right. There's, there's three doors here. I can see two of them. I saw three guys on the way into this place. Two of them definitely are carrying. So, and there's three guys in this room, you know, so you're sitting there going, okay. So if, if, and if this guy says this, or if this guy stands up and makes an aggressive motion, I'm going to, I'm going to kill these three guys. And then, and then we're going to, we're going to go out this door. We're going to head for the vehicle and I got to be ready to kill those guys. And you know what I mean? Like, and even though that never came to fruition that my brain learned that. And so, and so every threat was you manage the situation and every threat is potentially getting killed or kidnapped and then killed or whatever. And so then when I can't control the situation or exercise, when I at least can't exercise any illusion of control over the situation, it, it was a problem. So, it could be like, oh, you know, stuff like election night. Election night was terrible for me because because campaigns, campaigns I could be doing something, but once the polls closed, there's nothing you can do to feel any illusion of control. And so as the as the numbers come in and they're initially not good, and in one one of my elections I ended up losing, and 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 in the others I won, but you know initially they may not be great numbers. Like you have no control over it. And so my body, unbeknownst to me, was processing that as someone's coming to kill me. I'm not going to survive this. And so I would out loud say, I feel like I'm dying to my wife. And I, you know, now I look back and know, I can understand where that didn't make any sense to her at all, but it was the only way I could express what I felt. Wow. Yeah. Well, for starters, I just want to flag that what you're describing in terms of your experiences in Afghanistan um, I have a hard time imagining another situation that would do like a better job <laughs> of causing somebody to go into chronic stress and hypervigilance than that. You're in a totally unknown environment. You're working as an intelligence officer. You're effectively by yourself most of the time, and you have no idea the situations that you're walking into. Yeah, it turns like, out that's kind of traumatic. I, yeah, hol holy yeah. shit. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> but I spent 11 years saying to myself, well, I never fired my weapon. I'm not a combat veteran. And, um, you know, wow, I literally yeah. like my inner monologue was you're just an asshole who went to meetings. And uh, it wasn't until um, a clinical social worker at the VA who actually whose name was Forrest, uh, a woman whose name was Forrest said, said to me uh, that, uh, you know, you 
like you said what you just said and was like that you are a combat veteran and that that's traumatic and it, it took somebody kind of saying it back to me and over those years i had you know a lot of friends who had been in firefights who had said to me like hey man i don't i don't know if i could have done your job but i just always thought they were being you know generous and and so it took that for me to accept the idea that I am a combat veteran and that what I did was, you know, traumatic. Um, and now I understand that, but it, I, I, I spent a very long time telling myself that that was not the case and that therefore this couldn't be related to my deployment and it's just something wrong with me. So from where I'm sitting, just hearing you talk about, I'm hearing a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. Um, maybe some self identity stuff around like, am I actually worthy of being called oh, a, yeah. all a, that. a vet all that or stuff. something like that? Yeah. Was it like a gradual process of working with this or were there some sudden kind of inflection points where it, it was the big breakthrough moment that people talk about? Of like working through the shame and, and that kind of stuff, like in therapy? Yeah, yeah. 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 Just in the process with it in therapy, particularly around this issue, with, I think it's just totally central for most trauma survivors. You know, it's both like, so I remember when she said that to me, it was very validating. Um, and there are a few moments like that. Um, that was very validating. There were mo and then there was just the process of like sitting across from Nick, my therapist and, and realizing that the stuff I was saying was not unique and that, you know, this was the kind of stuff he hears from everybody who sits in this chair and, and so, and which was comforting. Um, because it, it, again, validating and validating, but also comforting because you're like, okay, well, if this is, if I'm saying the stuff other people say, and, and he works with the, like, there's a path out of this thing, you know, at least a path to, a and it makes it normal. Yeah, yeah totally. Where it's, it's not always going to feel this way, maybe. Um, and then there were other moments like that. Like I can remember, you know, I wrote toward the end of the book about reconnecting with one of the other intelligence officers I worked with and realizing that he had had for all those years, the exact same symptoms, um, you know, and then having him say to me like, Hey man, after we came, he outranked me. And, and, uh, so he saw a little more uh, higher level and he also went back after he went back later to Afghanistan and, uh, to the same place. And he, he told me like, Hey, what we did was crazy, man. Like after we, after us, like they changed the job, they didn't let him do it that way anymore. Like, and, and when he told me that, you know, after I left, he had to like have people try out for my spot and then he never ended up replacing me because like, you know, one guy in his like audition literally urinated on himself that, you know, that kind of stuff was validating. But all that said, I also had to, and this took a lot longer. I had to get to a place where I didn't need that validation anymore because I had to come to a place where I realized it doesn't matter. Like even if, even if all I had done was go over there and go to meetings and with like never left the base or whatever, it doesn't matter. And like, even if you never deployed and you had a car accident or a bad divorce, like we don't really know why your brain might respond to one thing or another. It doesn't matter. And, and what, and comparing it, that's what I also had to learn is that comparing it to other people's trauma was just a huge waste of my time because all it did was convince me not to go get help was to make me feel like I wasn't worthy of getting help. And that just, that was just time when I could have been feeling better. So. Yeah, no, totally. And I, I, again, I think that you see that over and over again with people in general who suffer from PTSD or have gone through traumatic experiences is that there's this, this tendency to um, do the whole, like somebody else had a worse day than I did thing. And that's really understandable. But like you're saying, all it does is distracts you from the, from your experience and from the pain you're going through. Yeah. Like you can't rank your trauma out of existence. Um, you, you know, it, it just doesn't work. It, it just diminishes your power to heal. What was your view of therapy prior to going in? Had you ever done therapy before? Did you have like a stance on it? Was it something that people with weaker constitutions did? Like, what was your take? I had never really done therapy. I went to a therapist once. Um, my wife had had me go to a therapist once right after the 2016 election, but like I'd had like one appointment where I talked to the guy for like 30 minutes. And then I had early on, I thought, because I was having all these bad dreams, I, I thought, well, I got to do something about dreams. So I had gone to see a guy who was like a dreams counselor and that, I don't know if that was therapy, but it really didn't work. Um, so really <laughs> okay. I had never been to therapy. M might not have yeah. been. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think he was a like a licensed whatever, but like. 
But I look sure. back and I'm like, that dude, like, he really missed when he didn't look at me and say, like, you have PTSD. Like, I mean, like, yeah, when I came in for my yeah. nightmares about Afghanistan. Like, perhaps he could have been helpful there. But anyway, um, so that said, uh, no, I never really had done it. I didn't have any negative preconceived notions about it. In fact, um, you know, I, because I was not a guy who had ever felt like, well, it doesn't work or anything. When I had, I had talked to a lot of veterans about the stuff they had been going through. And I had counseled a lot of people, or urged a lot of people to go get help and told them there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, it's what, you know, it's an injury. I just didn't believe that what I did counted. Um, and I think my, my misconceptions about therapy were that I, I, I assumed it to be a more passive process, like that, you, you know, sort of I'll sit there and I'll talk and then I'll just start to feel better. Maybe what I learned was that it's much more akin to physical therapy or even graduate school, right? It's like I had homework, I had exercises I had to do. It was difficult. Um, and it was a lot of work and I had to learn a lot. Um, and that actually made it for me as somebody who, you know, I did graduate school and, and, and everything. Uh, and I had been to additional school. Yeah. I didn't been to additional schooling in the army and everything. So that made it a little bit of an interesting challenge for me. If you could go back in time two, three years before you walked in for the first time, do you think that there's something that you could have told yourself or that somebody else could have told you that would have led you to get help sooner or otherwise just like make some different choices? Or do you think that you were just like, so where you were mentally at that point in time that like no one really could have shaken you well, out? That's of why it? I wrote this book because the, because this, this book is the book that I needed to read for all those years, but it didn't exist. And, yeah. and so that's yeah. why I, I wrote a book about the idea that post-traumatic growth is a real thing and that trauma is trauma and it doesn't matter how you sustained it. Um, and, and also because I didn't feel like in addition to there not being any like positive depictions of people with PTSD actually moving through therapy successfully there, I really didn't feel like there was anywhere I could go where I could really understand that what I was feeling was PTSD. And so that's why in, in Invisible Storm, I, I use a writing device purposefully where I, I don't, I don't use the vocabulary that I gained in therapy until I'm in therapy in the story. And because, because if, if, if somebody who was in my place a few years ago is reading the book and in the first few chapters, I'm talking about my hypervigilance, that's going to wash over me. It's not going to make any sense to me. I'm not going to connect with that. However, if I write it in a way where I put myself in my prior mindset in order to write that part of the story, which is what I did, well, then I, as the narrator, am explaining to you that I felt like I was in a great deal of danger and that, uh, that the world was a dangerous place and that when I looked at the people around me, I didn't feel like I was weird and different than them. I felt like they were naive and they were placing themselves in danger and they, and they had no idea what the world was really like. Well, that's a much longer explanation than saying I had hypervigilance, but that's something that somebody who has never been to therapy for this and might have PTSD or might know someone with it, they'll understand that when they read it. And so that's the kind of stuff that I needed. I needed somebody to say, here's what this feels like. Does this sound familiar? But I also needed somebody to say to me like, hey, what you went through was traumatic. Um, you know, um, because the thing is the army does this really necessary form of brainwashing where they teach us from the very beginning that what we are doing is no big deal, that somebody has it worse. And like, I know people who have received the Medal of Honor who feel that way because that's what they were taught. The reason we're taught that is because they need people to be able to go back out on patrol the day after their friend gets shot. They need me to be able to go back into meetings with you know, again, a, a day after day, knowing like this might be a trap. But the way you can do that is if you're like, it's not a big deal. Like I know people are having much worse, which is fine. Like I, I don't fault the army for that. That's what you got to do to do the job. I fault the army for the fact that nobody disabuses you of that notion when you leave. So that is, and we, we, we misunderstand that in our culture. We think that that is mostly men thinking 
that uh, PTSD is weakness, that trauma is weakness, and that they want to be strong. And I don't really think that's it. I think most veterans at this point get that it's not a sign of weakness. It's it's strength to go get help. I think we've gotten that message across. I think it's just that we're like, I have it on good authority that what I did was no big deal. And then a lot of people had it worse. So this can't be PTSD. So that's what we have to disabuse people of. We have to flip that switch off when people leave. So if, if I had left and instead of me like, you know, signing some paperwork and giving my last salute and becoming a civilian, if somebody had sat me down and been like, hey, look, I know what you did over there. And I know that we've been saying over and over this, you know, not a big deal. But actually, it's a very big deal. And uh, you're going to need help. Like, you're likely going to have some problems from this. And that's to be expected because what you in particular did actually was some crazy shit. I think that would have made a difference. Yeah, for sure. I think you're totally right. And, you know, you're a young guy. You had a extremely you know, rich political career where you were very, very accomplished. And there's a reasonable chance that I assume at some point in the future, you'll run for something again. Who knows? You talk about it kind of generally in the book. Um, is there, if you were to run again, are there things that you would do differently to protect your mental health? Yeah, like everything. Or otherwise insulate yourself? Like everything. Yeah, like, yeah I, I mean, figured. Yeah. But not everything. But I mean, I, I, everything would be different <laughs> in the sense that I would do something to protect my mental health. So yeah. You know, like now, yeah. I mean, I still, I stay pretty busy. I'm not, I, I purposefully am not anywhere near as busy as I was then. But, you know, I have, I have a podcast. I, I am a nonprofit executive. I, I, you know, I write books and I, I do this Afghan rescue stuff. And then I coach little league and I, and I play on a, on a men's baseball team and all that stuff. You got a full life. I, yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of stuff going on. Right. And uh, that said, I try to exercise every day and and yeah. I take time to understand when things are, um, when I need to stop for a minute and I need, you know, like I had a breakfast the other day with a friend who was in town, who's a, a pretty well-known national politician. And, and he, he's, I mean, he's really on the, on the, on the treadmill right now. Like he's all over the place. And I was talking to him about it and we were talking about how he might get more family time and more uh, opportunities to work out and stuff. And I said to him, I was like, I think you should cancel some stuff. And he was like, well, you know, I, don't, I, I can't. And I was like, no, no, no. I cancel stuff all the time. I was like, and it's wonderful. I just told him, I was like, I was like, I get, I just, I love to cancel things now. Like, you know, and I was like, you should try it. Like it's, and so that's, that's what I would do differently is, um, mm. and, in, and that's what I'm doing differently. And anything I do is like, I, I try and notice when I'm like up, Yep. This is, it's not, and that's the thing. It's not, oh, this is too much. It's, oh, this is mm -hmm. more than I want. And that's the difference. It used to be, yeah, it yeah. used to be like, and there was no too much for me then. But, but I, I'm careful to say that because I, what I don't want people to think is like somebody who's listening to this, who's maybe in a position to hire people. I don't want people thinking that like people with PTSD, you know, you can't put too much stress on them. That's not the case. I'm just saying, yeah, can't, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like I can, I could be the president. Like I, and I say that people think when I say that, that I'm trying to preserve the opportunity for myself. I, I don't, I don't worry about that. Uh, I really don't because it's either if I ever decide to do it, it's either preserved or it's not. And I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Um, I say it because there are people listening to this who are thinking of hiring somebody who might be a combat veteran. And I need to make clear I could be president. Uh, and I make that clear because I want them to understand you can hire that person for, for a management job. Like, and, and so I, I say that, but I also say like, we all got to take care of our mental health. So, you know, when stuff gets to be where it's like, Hey, this is not where I want. This is not the work-life balance I want. I'm taking some stuff off the table. It's, it's that simple. And that's what I would do then too. And if I couldn't do that and run, then I just wouldn't run. I mean, that's a pretty evolved, yeah perspective to have when we're talking about being president of the United States. You know what I mean? I think well, I, the big thing that's changed for me is uh, I've done enough for my country. I know that now. I didn't used to think that at all. I used to think quite the opposite. And, um, and I really like my life where it is. And so if I ever, I think there are people, I know there are a lot of people, uh, who assume that I'm just sitting here in a holding pattern waiting for my opportunity and then I'm just <laughs> pining to be back in a, waiting for the bell to ring yeah, I'm just pining to be back in a room calling people and asking for money um 
I am so not. Uh, I yeah. am enjoying my life for the first time in a long time. And mm. so that's the thing is that it's not like the right opportunity has to come up or one day maybe I'll decide to do it. No, it's like a lot will have to change. I'm not saying it won't, but a lot will have to change for me to say, I'm going to change the course I'm on because I got a, I got a nine year old and a two year old and, and, and a wife and all three are completely awesome. And I am a huge part of their life. And I wasn't before. And I just, and I'm enjoying myself. I don't have any interest in trading that in. That may change one day, but, um, or it may work, they may work together, but I'm just not willing to give up one for the other. And frankly, mm -hmm. I don't even want to right now. Like, I love my job. Like, I got this great job. I was going to say, sounds like a rational yeah, choice. I got this great job. Yeah. Like, if somebody could wave a magic wand right now and make me a U.S. senator or a cabinet uh, official, I'd be like, no way. Like, that's not a better job than the job I have. Yeah. So talking for a second about the job that you have, uh, one of the big projects you're involved with, you mentioned it earlier, it's Veterans Community Project, VCP. Um, and my understanding of it is that a big part of what it does is transitional housing for homeless vets. These are small homes that are near the structure of a base, if I'm saying that correctly, that people are able to stay in. Would you mind telling people a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so yeah, for sure. Veterans Community Project uh, is, an organi it, what we do is, basically two things. We run outreach operations um, that make a real difference in things like the suicide epidemic because we have a very low barrier to entry for any veteran to be able to get services. And we also uh, run what we're much better known for, which is our residential program, which transitions veterans out of homelessness uh, by, as you said, um, moving them into uh, tiny homes with wraparound case management services uh, to then transition them back into being able to be permanently housed successfully. Um, and we do it with an 85% success rate, uh, which is like unheard of in, in the world of homelessness. Um, and it's a great gig. My job is I'm the president of national expansion. So when I started with VCP three years ago, it was an extremely successful and inspiring, uh, organization in Kansas city with a full campus in Kansas city. Uh, today we are, we've been serving veterans in the Denver area for about a year and a half. Uh, we also are building a full campus there. Um, we are building a full campus and we'll begin serving veterans in St. Louis by the end of this year. Uh, and so we, we have a, a campus going up there. So that means like a village and outreach center, everything and we call it, we call the homes, we call it a village. Um, and then, uh, we are building now in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, we have bought property in Oklahoma city and we've started to raise money and started our campaign there where we will build. Uh, a village, uh, like a campus there as well. Um, and we are also in the process of, of moving forward with doing the same thing in Milwaukee. Um, and so it's a great job. I mean, it's not just, it's not just the cause, um, it, you know, and how personal it is to me. It's just a great place to work. I mean, uh, you know, everybody I work with, not everybody, a lot of the people I work with are combat veterans. And almost all of us in the leadership of the organization are also veterans of the Kansas City VA PTSD clinic. So, you know, it's it's a deeply innovative place that feels like home. I, I always say it's like if a Silicon Valley startup and a Ford operating base in Afghanistan had a baby. Like it just feels, it's just great. And, uh, and I love being a part of it. So people can go to vcp.org if they want to learn more. We're almost entirely... Uh, funded by private donations um, and also all my royalties from Invisible Storm go to Veterans Community Project. Oh, very cool. I didn't know that. That's really great to hear actually. Yeah. And has your personal involvement with the mental health side of this led you to want to be able to provide more services like that to people? Or is that something that you're interested in doing in the future as part of VCP? There's really no programming changes that I've made that I'm like, oh, that's because that's not me. I'm not a clinician. Like, the 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 co-founders they what they created is awesome and we you know we round off little edges here and there and we do things like now when we build a village we realize oh the parking lot needs to be bigger and you know we need more family units and stuff like that but i i can't claim to nor would i to have uh made some great programming changes because it's not it's not what i do there um we have great people who do that but however um i do now really enjoy separately from that doing stuff like this. I, you know, writing the book, I give, I give some talks about, and I give a lot of interviews about mental health. Um, it's not the role in public service I initially envisioned for myself, um, you know, to be as, you know, one person referred to it as the 
poster child for post-traumatic growth. But you know what? It allows me to make, frankly, a much greater difference in people's lives than I really ever did in any elected office I held. So that's, I think, the space I exist in is I talk about this stuff and I help people feel seen and I help people see that maybe they need to get help or maybe that uh, somebody they, close to them does or maybe they understand someone close to them better or, you know, maybe they've already gotten help, but it reduces the stigma. I mean, those are all good things and I'm pleased to be involved in them. Well, Jason, just on a personal level, I think you've done a great job in the role and I appreciate you doing it. I think you've helped a lot oh, of people. Thanks. thanks very much. Yeah, for sure. And also, thanks for taking the time to do this today. I really enjoyed talking with you. It was well, they were time. great questions. I've done probably 60 of these interviews and so it's always, it's always good when you can go like, oh, that's a new question. Uh, so good job. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you, man. I appreciate yeah, absolutely. that. Absolutely. Uh, well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. I had a great time talking with Jason today, and I got to say on a personal level, I just really appreciate how revealed he has been emotionally about the process that he went through, about what it was like for him, about grappling with PTSD and depression. And I think that it's done a lot to take the sting out of the stigma that's attached to these kinds of mental health conditions, where for a long time, I think it's Fair to say that a lot of these issues were regarded as problems that people have if they're not strong enough to not have them. And so to have somebody specifically like Jason, who is so incredibly accomplished, um, is a member of the military, and is also just like clearly a very tough and strong-minded and dedicated individual, go through these challenges and talk really frankly about how, no, it's not a toughness issue, I think that's just such a huge thing here. We began the conversation with me asking him about the period of time between coming home from Afghanistan and when he actually went in for treatment and what that time was like for him. What were the symptoms that he was going through? And also alongside that, what kind of education, if any, he had received on PTSD prior to entering the military or when he came home. And he really leapt fully back into the political world with all of its many demands. And as we know, running for office is a pretty darn stressful job. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Jason was really nose to the grindstoning it for years and years and years. And one of the things that we know about PTSD is that there are these various factors that can either insulate somebody a little bit from developing PTSD or make them more likely to develop PTSD. And some of the protective factors are things like having really, really good social relationships, having like a strong social network is a huge thing for people. And then also having structural support like having easy access to resources of different kinds that could support somebody through that difficult experience. And then something that we know makes it more likely that somebody will develop PTSD is if they have a lot of stress immediately after the primary stressful experiences. So in this case, Jason was going from working as an intelligence officer in Afghanistan in a job that was so intense and so stressful that they essentially removed the position after that he left because they were like, we just can't do this anymore, this is crazy, to immediately jumping into a high-stress, high-stakes environment where he's running for major political offices. So it makes perfect sense how Jason would develop PTSD. He was in these incredible stressful circumstances, and then he moved from them to really very stressful circumstances. And that's why I think it's so noteworthy that it took him a long time to come to terms with the fact that he had PTSD and to claim that diagnosis, to feel like he had earned it and that he felt enormous shame and guilt around his experiences and around his own processing of those experiences, um, that he felt like he hadn't necessarily earned the title of being a vet because he was never in a true live fire situation. But his life was on the line every day. And I just think it's so telling how if that person can convince themselves that their experiences weren't actually traumatic, wow, what are other people doing on a daily basis with their much more normal range experiences that are still nonetheless absolutely traumatic? And this just points to something that we see so frequently with PTSD and complex PTSD in general is how people often feel like they haven't earned their diagnoses, how, uh, well, what happened to me was tough, but was it really actually traumatic? I don't know. Maybe I'm just kind of a weak person. Like, no, what happened to you probably was traumatic. And just because there's somebody out there who's having a worse day than you are doesn't mean that your day isn't bad. And that is just such an important 
thing to hold in mind in all of these conversations, and it's a stumbling block that comes up for people in their own healing process over and over again. We then spent some time talking about Jason's actual process in therapy, including some of the things that he did. Uh, two big ones that stood out were prolonged exposure and cognitive reprocessing, and some of the homework that he was given included things like having to sit in a relatively crowded environment, which would activate, of course, a lot of uncomfortable feelings related to his hypervigilance, given the situations that he was in in Afghanistan. And then another thing that he did is he had to tell the story of one of the really incredibly scary, frankly, situations that he was in. Um, and his therapist would then ask him questions about it, and they recorded it. And he would have to listen to that story back until he got to a point with it where he no longer had intense emotional content and, in fact, was just kind of bored by the story in general. We then spent some time at the end talking about his work with the Veterans Community Project. And we also talked for a little while about how members of the military think about these kinds of mental health challenges that are extremely normal in that line of work and what could potentially be done or changed in order to improve access for people and frankly just give people a better chance at being able to recognize and deal with these issues as they come up. I had a great time talking with Jason today, really enjoyed the conversation. Again, his book is Invisible Storm, A Soldier's Memoir of Politics and PTSD, and he's also the host of Majority 54, which is a popular political podcast. If you're interested in learning more about either of those or learning more about Veterans Community Project, I've linked all of that in the description of today's episode. That's it for today. If you've been enjoying the podcast, would appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe, leave a rating, a positive review, a comment, whatever you can do through the platform you're listening on. And hey, you can maybe even tell a friend about it. It's one of the best ways we have to reach new people. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll receive a whole bunch of bonuses in return, things like transcripts of the episodes, uh, ad-free versions of our episodes, as well as expanded show notes where I dive into the research that goes into everything that we create over here. Again, thanks so much for supporting the show, and I'll talk to you soon.